Hello and welcome to the Happiness Is podcast with me, your host Bruce Aitchison from Happiness is Egg Shaped. And today we have got a man I've known for a very long time, uh, an absolute hero, now doing great things in exile uh, from the borders. He's only the second Hoyt man to feature on the pod. I hope there's going to be more, but I've been keen to speak to him for a while, finally pinned him down. He's a very busy boy making the Irish future of rugby secure with all the good work that he's doing. A native of Hoyt. Uh, lots of stories to tell and a brilliant man that I probably first properly met in New Zealand and what a whale of a time we had but he was a fantastic rugby player a very good rugby player who is now a brilliant coach and who knows what the future holds but we'll get a blether with him and find out so please welcome the one and the only Mr Greg Oliver hello sir hello Bruce hello that was uh, some intro uh did you do it at last? I'm kind of blushing here a bit. Well, you are a hero. Let's start with the, the present. What are you up to just now? Uh, I'm here in Munster, in the heart of Munster. I'm in the uh, elite pro player, um, obviously the, the HPC here, it's high performance unit in, in University of Limerick. Um, so I work here day to day with uh, the next crop of Munster players. And there's a heap of them. The, the production line in Ireland is absolutely superb. It must be an exciting job to have. Yeah, we've got, a, well, we're we're always kind of looking up the road to Leinster a wee bit because they've, they've got a, a hell of a production line through their, their schools. But uh, we're trying to, trying to well, not we don't look there all the time. We try and concentrate what we've got here and make them better players. And um, my role here is to look at the, the next, group of players coming through the into the academy, working with the boys in the academy. And I, I actually do a wee bit with the senior players as well. I take the nines um, and I take the A team as well. So uh, there's a lot involved in that role, but um, I've been doing that for a, a number of years now. So it's a great environment. I enjoy it here. It's, uh, I mean, I don't know if you've, any of your listeners have been to Limerick, but Limerick's a real sport and city, whether it's uh, rugby, uh, Harland or whatever, it's just, it, it, they just they just go after every sport, you know. Have you had a go at Harland? Uh, yep, I've, uh, I actually coached Harland. Uh, so uh, myself and a, a man called Joe Quaid, uh, he was a, a kind of legend of, of uh, Limerick Harland in, in the 90s. We, we took on the Maru Bohar under 14s, which is a, my local parish. So in uh, under 14s, my son was involved, Joe's sons were involved. Um, they played hurling one week, then Gaelic football the next. Uh, and then our club is a real hurling club, so um, we didn't. We got beat in the championship by odd points. So, but we made the final of the fo football, and we won the final of the football. So, which was unheard of from a, from a club uh, like Maruboha. So, we we obviously got sacked the following year because we won the football. <laughs> so, there you go. And is there a lot? Uh, is there a lot of transferable skills? Because you know, this is this is what we hear. This is what we I think we all know that the more the kids do, and you can see some of the the Aussie players and some of the Irish players who seem to have plucked skills from one and, and put them into another. Are you able to go and identify guys in those environments? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's boys who we we encourage our you know younger players to play every sport up until obviously. When the heat comes on at different levels, but I mean, even Jack, my son, Kira, my daughter, we encourage them to play a lot of sports. And the Gaelic games are very transferable. Uh, football, especially Gaelic, uh, obviously Gaelic football, and uh, hurling as well with hand-eye coordination. There's loads of boys. Uh, there's a couple of boys who come through the system now. Patrick Campbell, who's now in played at the weekend for Munster. He was a he was a footballer in Cork. Um, he probably had a Darren Sweetnam as well, who'd played uh, at Harlan at a, you know, a great level for Cork and transferred, across, you know, took the decision to play rugby, which is, um, it's a hard thing to do at the time for players to understand what, you know, to make decisions at that, that level. But um, obviously rugby is a global sport, is a big thing here. But, um, you know, the Gaelic films are just, uh, Gaelic games are just in Ireland only, you know. But the... Um, Limerick at the moment are going through a great patch, Limerick Hurling. They've won two of the last three years in the All Ireland and it's a, it's a big thing over here, you know. And 
<laughs> what did the under fourteen kids think when a guy with your accent turns up to teach them how to play their own game? Yeah, uh, yeah. Once you get to know them, I mean, a lot of things are transferable, but the, you know, you get the odd, you know, they get the what's he saying kind of thing first, and then um, once they get into the drills and that kind of thing, the, the drills are very transferable. So it was a great education for me to work with somebody like Joe. And uh, and the players and give them give them the chance to, to have a look at what happens at that level, you know. Is it a lot like when you were growing up, small town, play everything with your mates, uh, almost being the social event? What what is it today? Summer is athletics and cricket, winters football and rugby, and you just you just play. Absolutely, um, yeah, yeah. There, there is a bit of you know there is problems with um, in overlapping and different things, but. Uh, most of the cl- most of the sports don't overlap, and uh, the players can play both. You know, um, it's it's a great. I mean, there's loads of opportunities here in, in Ireland for different sports, so that's a good thing for for for. Um, you know, it's it's a great it's a great thing for player uh, youngsters to 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 be encouraged to play different sports, and they can pick and choose when they when they get older. It's, uh, so so when you get hold of them, then. And you've sort of convinced them that that rugby's the game for them. What's what's your sort of conversion rate? Is the is the academy really bearing fruit? Is it a, is it a production line that is getting players to the elite level, and then you hand them on? Yeah, it's good. Uh, we we've got a good uh, rate of uh, you know boys coming through the system. The big thing is we we're trying to work hard with the clubs at the moment because um, it's been reported obviously that. Clubs are something they're getting neglected. The All Ireland League here, and then obviously the the clubs in Scotland are in a similar similar vein. But we're we're trying to work hard with the clubs to help them uh, as much as they can. So a lot of all of our players will play in club rugby. Uh, um, so even if the players you know from coming from a club, it's not maybe a, a Division One A or Division Down B. They, they, we try and keep them in that club as long as they can until they they, they have to try and you know transfer up up and play a different uh, better level. But we're trying to work harder with the with the clubs and uh, help them as much as we can. We're, we're availability availability of players and so on. And uh, obviously, we're trying to get the coaches up. You know, keep them in line with what we're trying to do. So, yep, yeah, just a bit of education in that and that and being more uh, transparent with them. You know. That's music to a lot of folks' ears, letting players play and have them in the club game, and then it gives them that sense of belonging. There's a lot of guys I read about in Ireland who go back and finish off with their clubs. Is that something yeah. you encourage them to do? We'd like to see that, but I mean, I think the professional game is a bit different now where if they finish one club, they've obviously the world's a massive, you know, the rugby world's not going massive now, so there is a bit of scope to go elsewhere, which is. We wouldn't stop players doing that, but uh, yeah, we've had a few players. You know, we'll go back to the clubs. Just recently, Duncan Williams retired and he's back playing with Corcon. So um, you know, there's a great example of giving back to the game. And a lot of our ex-players are now are coaching. Uh, so Ian Kitley, for example, is co- coaching within the academy. He's doing uh, kicking, plus he's uh, he's coaching one of the local clubs, which is a great education for him. So he, he's on the on his on his coaching pathway now, so just try and encourage that these kind of players come to stay in the game. And when you're working with the nines at that elite level, is there a bit of you feels like I've I've still got it? I could still do a job. <laughs> no, yeah, maybe, <laughs> that, maybe the dive pass, but uh, um, they just look at me when I say about dive pass. Just, what's he on about dive pass? You know, but I've, uh, with uh, Conor Murray had a dive pass there in the Autumn Internationalist, so I made a real highlight of. Um, Open that and put it on the, on the WhatsApp, you know. It's time to bring it back. Rupert Moon's the same. He wants the dive pass to come back. Yeah, I think there's a place for it, especially, well, Connor did it on his own line, which uh, it does, you know, to, I, I gave the example, it does block the opposition nine. So you're always blocking that, that the, the, the player from getting to the ball. So he used that appropriately on that occasion. So it's a, a great example. Nice, I love it. And your boy had a picture at the weekend that that a few people got their eyes on uh, in the changing room. A proud moment. Yeah, I don't know how that got out because Jack Jack actually asked for that um, picture because I, I was more pleased that he asked because uh, I'm never one to push him anyway. So uh, 
he asked for the picture and then he sent it to his uh, granny and hoik so uh, she was really pleased you know his granny and hoik so what, does he know about mansfield does he know about the teary bus and the uh, robbie dies uh, yeah. yeah he's been well educated <laughs> <laughs> uh, i was there in october there we went down to mansfield and they kicked actually i got permission from pundy Robert to go in onto the pitch so uh he was kicking away. He was, um, he was coming back from a, a foot injury, so that's the first time he kicked. Actually, he was on Mansfield, and we were up the park in different places that are doing his training. So, uh, kind of, it was kind of a bit of a deja vu. Some of the places I've, I've been trained uh, training before, even with the professional runners up the top of the park, I, I, I used to do that with, with Tony Stanger and a few other players, um, Sean McGawkey, and back in the day, who was a great two hundred meter runner. He used to block everybody else and let, let us through in the last 10 metres. Um, it was good, great that we could uh, show Jack some of the places that he used to train, you know, and he, he trained away there. You know. uh, pilgrimage to the grey old tune. Mm-hmm. There's no <laughs> park like Wilton Wilton Lodge Park, though. It's fantastic. That, you know, uh, you, it's you a don't, great... The people don't really um, understand how, how great a place that is, you know, to have that kind of amenity in the, on, the, on the doorstep. And it's a place where, you know, if the trees could speak, the the players they've seen and the coaches they've seen, gone out into what you know modern. You've got Hoggy and and Darcy and Suz kind of yeah. at the at the top of their game now, but there's been so many. And I think you were the fiftieth Hoyke player capped by Scotland. Is that right? Yeah, I like to believe that. Somebody t- told me years ago. Yeah. So uh, yeah, listen, it's. Uh... When you go into Mansfield, as you know, Bruce, you see all these caps on the wall. It's, it's just a big thing. It's massive. I mean, you're older, were... when you're older, it gets more massive. <laughs> who who are your heroes? Who did you look up to and think I want a bit of that? Um, to be to be honest, my biggest hero when I was growing up was Raymond Corbett because he was playing for Hoyke. Uh, I didn't get a chance to play, to see Glenn Turnbull or or Harry Whitaker, who were legends, you know, with my, my father had told me about, all about them, but I didn't get a chance to see them. I, I know Glenn, I knew Glenn Tur- uh, Turnbull pretty well because he was a, a friend of a friend, you know, so uh, I used to see Glenn when he, he popped up every time from Workington, so I had a great night with him when I was playing. So he was a big influence when I was younger, uh, along with Raymond Corbett, who kind of helped me when I was really young because my, my dad yeah, knew his father as well, so... He took me for a few sessions. So there is the kind of people uh, kind of kind of resonate with me here. The other thing was obviously my father bumped into Gareth Edwards when he was younger, got his autograph, and uh, that kind of that kind of stood. And I used to watch him when he was when he was younger. You know how how he how he played the game and so on. So there's a lot of things that kind of shape you as you're as you're younger. Dave Leverage was another one who was. Uh, when he played for New Zealand, I got a chance to when they were to do a session with him. Through apparently, uh, actually, it was Norman Mayer who ch- got me up to to work with him because um, he did a session in Edinburgh. So I, I was I, I made the opportunity to get up there and, and uh, do a couple of sessions with him when I was uh, I think it was eighteen or nineteen. So it was it was that was that was thing that kind of st- stuck by me, you know. And you you obviously loved it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was fortunate in a way to play for. There was no age group, so now uh, under 18s were coming into into Scottish rugby at the time. But I played for the under 21s for I think three seasons, uh, which was probably unheard. Of, you know, but um, that kind of kind of built the built the foundations for me to to push on. I was really when I first came into the hockey team. I think I've mentioned this before in Ian Landles' book that the, the um, I, I jumped into into her dress room, you know, eyes wide open with I think it was seven or eight internationalists in the squad. It was just it was mind boggling when you walk down there and you see all these players, you know, walking into that dress room. And it, I mean, it must have been, but you you were there because you were good enough. Did they did you have to earn the respect, or did they just let you get on with it? Did they give you a hard time? How did it work when you first walked in? Well, first of all, I went to the wrong peg. Um, <laughs> so um, it was, I think it was Keith Murray and boys like that were saying, no, there's a peg there, not knowing that it was Derek Grant's peg. And nobody went near Derek Grant's peg. Um, it, I was, you know, that's where I got on really well with Sean McGaughy because they said, don't go there. So uh, 
myself and Sean hit it off after that. So, um, no, I just they were really encouraging. I think the big thing for I think borders rugby as well is you you learn to keep your feet underneath you because you can't get a run a, run away with yourself because uh, you can walk you know you know when you've played poorly or you've done something bad or whatever you just you, you walk along the street and somebody ignore you you know you've had a bad <laughs> you've had a bad game so uh, no I, I think it they encourage you to, to keep your feet on the ground which was a big thing for me and uh, and just keep on improving and uh, you I I'd, I'd big big moments of learning with uh, like the Jim Rennick and Colin Deans would I mean Colin would be first out last in the last last out uh, last back in you know because he would he'd work on his skills you know consistently and he'd pull me along for different things so uh, that kind of stuck by me yeah that kind of work ethic there and uh, just the maybe I'll probably learn about it later but deliberate practice how how it can how can it really help you you know. And that's kind of something we spoke to Tony Stanger about. You didn't know the terms, and you didn't. You just did it because that's what somebody, a role model, had shown you. You just had that work ethic. So that group around you, they must have identified something in you if they were willing to put time and effort into you. Yeah, I mean, it's when you're older, you just don't realise, you know, the the effect that some people have had on you, and. Uh, you know, going from you know some some of the old worthies of of the of the of the club, you know, Hugh McLeod and uh, Dan Sudden, uh, Elliot Broach, you know, these kind of people, they were they were the kind of sports psychologists in back in the day. Because I mean, I went back you know, two years ago. I went and did a sports performance masters in psychology there. And uh, when you read up on things like that, you just don't realise how valuable some of the lessons he, he had as a youngster through the kind of doing of these people you know they, they've they've been there done that and um their experiences are kind of rub off off on you you know so uh, i mean you kind of miss that nowadays i think uh, i've always i encourage our players here to go into the bar after the game not to have too much obviously but uh but to, to go into the bar speak to the player the ex-players speak to the you know the the, the older guys in the in the in the club rooms there, because they, they are they've been there they've they've seen a lot they've experienced a lot and uh, I always encourage that because I think it's it's something it's maybe uh, untapped because I mean even when I was doing my psychology masters there there's some of the things that they are it comes back to you in, in in your head that are really invaluable really you know so it's some of the lessons that you can you can learn there you know and being in a small town. Like you said, you kind of get away from it. If you're stood in the butcher's queue, there's somebody telling you what you should have done on the Saturday. Do you, do you miss that? Yes, I do. But uh, Limerick's a bit like that. Um, there's different, obviously, there's so many senior clubs here and there's so much rivalry. It's a bit like the borders in uh, in, in, in put into one city. Um, you've got Young Munster here, you've got Gary Owen, you've got Shannon, you've got Bose. You know, uh, you've, you know the, there's a load of massive rivalry here and that's good for the game and that's when you look back in it the the Hoyt Gala you know Hoyt Melrose uh, Gala New Gala Melrose with everybody you know that kind of rivalry just spurs people on and um, it's very evident here and it's not so much in Cork because Cork's Cork's like um, Cork Constitution and UCC now Highfield are going so well he, uh, in Cork now, so that's getting back. You know, there's a bit of rivalry there, which is which is great. But I think it's um, it's something that stood to me, uh, and it's you can see it here, and even in the school game, there's you know, it's it's um, the school cup, schools cup is a big thing here, and uh, you don't want to take that kind of that away from any you know. It's, you want to try and grow that as much as you can, and that's what we're trying to do as well. Trying to keep that, keep that vibrant, and um, and um, keep the players enjoying that, that the rivalry and the, even the competition side of it. it. It can be kind of full on, but it's uh, it'll, it'll 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 actually make the player grow, you know, um, because it's it's so intense sometimes, you know. And I I absolutely agree that the competition bit sometimes gets a bad rap. But the things you've just mentioned there, 
Hoik Gala Gala Melrose Melrose Hoik that that competition Gala in my day. <laughs> <laughs> that that competition drove you on that that would be although there'd be the internal I'm going to do that sprint session up the park I'm going to stay out and do my skills I'm going to do hill runs with Deansy the internal bit was there but you'd be wanting to knock one over on the Saturday against whoever it was you were playing and that then got you the chance to play for the South, which then gave you the shot window for Scotland. So that competition, do you think it's as as important, as fierce as it was then? Um, a lot of people say, no, it's not. But I think, it, I think it's, it's, it's different now, you know, in terms of there's so many different opportunities for, for youngsters coming through. Um, and um, you don't you, I mean to know they're probably... It's not all in one game, which is something that's good in a way. You can keep that intensity, but it, it's not all in one game. Where you know, years years ago, it was like you had to win every game to be top of the table. There's a bit less. I'm not going to say there's less competition, but I think um, it gives players more opportunity to, to perform at the best level. And um, we're all saying that one one bad game doesn't make you, it doesn't break you. So. Um, we're trying to to get that consistency over a period for, for players. That's that's a big thing for 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 us in terms of growing players and making and make, getting them better and getting them ready for professional rugby. Who who did you love playing against? Who was your who was it really got you up? Was it an individual? Was it a team? What what was it that really made you get the fire in the belly? Um, when I would. I, felt, I always felt when when the Ho- when I broke into the Hoy team, everybody was out to get us because we were at the top of the tree, we were, we were the hunted. Uh, so, no, I, I just think you know the Bobbers of Border Derby's gala were big in the day. I mean, my tussles with Dave Bryson was there uh, were were there to be seen. <laughs> uh, and then when obviously when I was playing against Roy for against Jed, it was you know was, I, I always looked up to Roy in a big way. Um, and even when I was in the Scotland squad, I'd still have that kind of, he'd still have that aura around me, you know. So uh, I was trying to impress him, not just, you know, when I played against him, I was trying to impress him, not not to get on, onto his back, onto, onto the other side of him. But um, then obviously when Gary Armstrong came along, we did fierce rivalry off the pitch, but we were best of friends offwards, off the pitch. But, um, you know, it's always kind of, it was, you know, it's maybe I kind of look back and maybe, uh, yeah, maybe I was a wee bit lucky, unlucky with sitting on my uh, backside for so many caps. But you better be in there and not being there. You know, that, that was my kind of philosophy at the time and try and get as much out as, as I could. So, um, no, um, from a team's perspective, we I remember Derek Grant was big and instilling with Hoyke. Every game was, was, was different and... Uh, you had to go out and try and be, match your, your performance from the last game and try and you know be better from the last time. And that's that's that kind of stuck with me all all my years. That yeah, you play well one week, but you you, you start at zero the next next day and move on. You know, it's it's brilliant to hear that rivalry. And now, you know, the pro game. There's only two teams in Scotland. So there's only two scrum halves get a, a chance to have a crack at each other. Mm-hmm. Whereas you've just mentioned three class scrum halves in Mm. three clubs and that's before you went any further those are local derbies games that mean everything that that then should mean that the peak of the pyramid's bigger shouldn't it yeah uh during my time you know not just the the teams i've mentioned previously but even gordon hunter and and and, uh selkirk bob horgath and and in kelso it would be it would be massive every week. You, you'd, somebody would you couldn't really sit back and in, enjoy it. A wee bit. You, you know you had to be on your toes. You had to be you had to be hundred percent because uh, there's always players um, coming through there. I was just it was it was relentless. And then the, but I think everybody enjoyed that that week to week competition and uh, you, you, you knew whether there, there maybe a break coming you maybe got a border league but it was it was the same in the border league it was it was um it was big time then and uh, you just couldn't you had to be on your game as simple as that and do you look back at your playing and think how the hell did i do that because you would uh, you know if you start on a saturday you play the game you have a few beers on a saturday night on the sunday 
you probably gave yourself a rest but did something Monday your own session, Tuesday club session, Wednesday a south session, Thursday your tra- Friday maybe had a, a night off and then it all starts again and when internationals were in you were up at Murrayfield on a Sunday morning. How how did you fit in and else in? Um at that time, you know, I just it was you just go with the flow. It, that that's that was the given and uh you know, obviously weights was coming at the time, and but I, I would I'd been working with um, I got the opportunity to work with the Southern Reporter uh, through the press group uh, when I was youngster, and I moved from uh, working with uh, in, in the you know the printing industry to moving into journalism when the when it went to, into computers, you know. So I was I was really indebted to John Smale, who was my boss at the time, um, and he just backed me and everything. If I needed time off, it was great and. Even um, unknown to him, I was even in the, when it was a print room. I'd be lugging um, pages of print along, so that was my wait session uh, in in there. And um, I, but, I mean, you just don't know how we are. Uh, he didn't really know any better at the time, but you, you turned up for training, did your training, had something to eat, got to bed, and then you're up for work the next day. And uh, that's the way it was. And the Sunday sessions in in, in uh, I can remember the Sunday sessions in in Munster, uh, in, in Murrayfield, sorry, with with uh, Creamy and uh, Beach and uh, Richie Dixon, Derek Grant. They were they were really physical sessions, and uh, we just had to get on with it. But he, the the big thing was to to, to to get into that was was hard, and staying in it was even harder. So. Um, that was the big thing, the big motivation. You wanted to stay there because if you got any um, glimpse of an international, you just wanted to try and be there all the time because it was just, it was, it was infectious. There was an infectious squad at the time during the early, late eighties, nineties. Scotland were going really, really well. Uh, I mean, I keep on reminding all the internationalists over here uh, that I never lost to Ireland, even sitting on the bench. You know, so. Uh, that's a big thing for me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I'm a, I'm a huge believer in we're all products of the, the places we've come from and the things that we've done. You've mentioned some absolute titans of rugby coaching, just in almost as a throwaway comment there. Did you always want to be a coach? Did you know that was going to be part of your future, whether it was a professional or not? Did you think you were going to be a coach? Um, I don't really know. I, I mean, um, at the time, I, I remember Colin, myself and Colin, Colin Deans had just finished. So Colin asked me, you know, I was in, still in the high squad and, and uh, around the Scotland squad at the time, that the, there, was a, there was a high Galbi and under 16 is going to be put together. So uh, Colin asked me to help him with it. So that was my really first taste of it. I think Roddy was in that team, actually. But um, yeah, So they were a great squad. Um, I remember... Uh, Cammy Bruce, Alan Chalmers, all these kind of boys were in the squad. So uh, we had a great, great time with these boys, and uh, that kind of, that kind of gave me the chance to, to see if I liked it or not. I really enjoyed that. So since, really since then, I, I, I enjoyed it, and uh, I, I managed with when, when Jim Hay got the role with the Young Scotland squad. I was, I was kind of helping Jim at a couple of the events and really got a taste of some of the things that we, they were doing on from the development side. And I got into the development role in the southwest, which took me to from from Langham all the way across the Stranraer. So it was a big area. I really enjoyed that, and um, I just I was always kind of well planned. I thought it was well planned at the times, you know, in terms of different getting around the place and make sure everybody saw me putting plans in place to how to grow the game and. Uh, I, I forged a lot of good relationships in the southwest, and um, I th- you know I, I really enjoyed that five year period there. So that kind of kind of set me set me up for where where I am now. Really, it was that was an amazing time. I was a young player at that point, and you guys were like rock stars. That sort of group of development officers, because that you could see how much it was a new role. And you, you were in a lot of ways. You were just kind of making it up as you went along, but because you were so passionate about it, and you all seemed to get on brilliantly. No doubt there was niggles, but the performance in front of folk, 
you were all sort of joshing off each other and and having a bit of crack and you could all still do the skills and you were decked out head to toe in gear mm-hmm. and arriving in the car with a, across the side i mean you must have you must have felt 10 feet tall at times when you were because it, it was brand new there wasn't club development officers and festivals and all you you were the ones who were creating that yeah, I was a, uh, it was great at the time because there was a lot of competition between, obviously, myself, Richie, Gray, Stevie Gemmell, Colin Ireland, Graham Kilgower, these kind of players, people who are uh, driving the development of the game in different parts of Scotland. And uh, we just, you know, we, we just had a healthy rivalry and competition, that, you know, with num- not just numbers, but how the clubs got in, rolled in behind some of the things we were doing. And then, because it, you can go into places and just make an impression, and then you go away, and it kind of falls apart. But we, we, we were always trying to bring the clubs involved in it and the schools, getting the cl- schools and clubs together, and try and work the best for their area. We some big, big, big uh, gains there in terms of you know players in the game, uh, boys and girls. So that was uh, the only thing for me is from a girls' point of view. It didn't. There wasn't a time where. They really took it on board where it's now it's totally different when the uh, girls and, and boys rugby go hand in hand in clubs which is fantastic when you look back now can you remember seeing him and thinking he's destined for great things yeah i'd, I'd had a conversation with nick de luca years ago um i remember a big uh, going into lockerbie academy when nick was there and uh, just it just passed. I was actually speaking to his dad around it because I, I, I was driving into Lockerbie uh, and I saw Nick going out the school. I said, So I stopped the car and, and got out of the car. I said, Nick, where are you going? He says, Oh, he's, I'm not going to train. And I said, Why? He says, uh, we've got, You've got a game next week. Oh, the players are rubbish. So I, I managed to convince him to get back in the car because I said, uh, you know, you, you're the you're probably the reason some of the players are playing. So uh, you, you can see the how good you are and they want to play with you. So I kind of try and get, trying to convince them to back uh, back pedal and go back into training. So Nick was one example of one player who obviously went all the way. Uh, but a lot of the big thing for me was players going onto their club and playing for their club and still playing their club and coaching their club and and being administ- administrators in the club. That's that's the big thing of uh, trying to develop the game you know there was a high chance though without you guys there the numbers wouldn't have grown you know nick de luca might not have gone on and got caps that you know especially in the area you were working in where there was a lot of keen volunteers and a lot of great clubs but it wasn't really producing players for whether you use that phrase or not the next level but also the thing you've spoken about is that long-term pathway. They then play for their clubs, they fall in love with it, they end up coaching and being the volunteers. When you when you look back at that era, can you see the important role that you played? Are you able to give yourself a pat on the back for it? Uh, no, really. I, I just I mean, at the time, uh, it's all about relationships, uh, all about people, because uh, I've, I've kind of learned more now that, the people I was involved in with then were just so passionate, and um, it's the people in clubs that make the clubs, uh, and it's just building that relationship. I sometimes find it's difficult for governing bodies because it, it, they kind of lose track in terms of numbers and uh, that kind of. Thing. It's usually just a numbers game with them, but the people on the ground, it's all about the relationships and the people there. Are driving the thing on. If 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 you can get on and and have the same vision, I think that's that's what it's about. It's it's about people in the places. And you you were the face of that governing body, though. So mm. you know that you were the sort of front of house staff. So by you building that good relationship, that probably made them feel a greater sense of belonging to the, you know, the union. Because yeah, you, yeah. you kind of touch it, you you were the you were the the interface, I suppose, to give it its modern modern term. So, is that something you were aware of, or were you just being Greg and trying to do the best job you could? Yeah, I was. A, I was. A, I think I became aware of then because uh, you, in, in 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 earnest, they were your you were your paymasters really at the end of the day because they have to they have they had to actually. 
they had to help you achieve what they want to achieve. See what I mean? So, so uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that kind of side of it. Yeah, yeah, there is sometimes confrontations with with personalities, but at the end of the day, you're wanting the, the main th the same thing. So, I tried as much as I could to to get on with as many people as I could when when I was working in that role. Um, and when I went back to the board, it was even more so because. You know, you can imagine Bruce when I came back into the borders. Myself and Richie were working. Richie was had the the same feeling he got in Hoyt, and I had the same feeling I had in Bala. So um, no, no, I just we, we just got on with it and just smiled through it. And everything, you know. And we we met in New Zealand because Glasgow District used to take a squad of boys uh, to New Zealand as a as an experience and went as a, a representative squad. That that was an amazing opportunity for those guys, and so many, you know, the the ones I know, you and Murray certainly went on to get capped, but there was other guys who did great things for for clubs, and uh, Big C went down south and played, I think, professionally down south. To have a hand in in those young people's lives is a huge honour, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I I take a bit of pride in that. You know, I don't don't say much about it but I like to see how players move on and I keep in touch with a lot of players uh, who move on even, you know from even my role here we have a lot of players who've moved on to different parts of the world I'd keep in touch with them um, yeah it's 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 a big thing that going back to the Glasgow Thistles that that came around because of with a we actually had a, a Scottish Thistles we didn't terminate that but with a a group of when professionalism first came in, we took a group of twenty players across to Waikato, and uh, I had a good relationship with Kevin Green, the ex Glasgow coach, who would obviously been the Chiefs coach, the, uh, the first Chiefs coach in uh, professional rugby. So we kind of set up this um, exchange of players really across, and, and it was for twelve weeks. So that was the first move into, it, and uh, a lot of these players. Came through the system uh, into professional rugby on the back of that, and uh, I went out for the second stint of that just to make sure they were doing the right things and turning up for tr sessions. And uh, we actually had a couple of games as a squad. We just, uh, if we were down a few numbers, we, we got a few players uh, in that region to play for us. A bit like the and played the New Zealand Barbarians and things like that. So it was a fantastic um, experience for these players to play club rugby in the Waikato, uh, which is. It's a bit similar to the borders, actually, because um, they all hate each other. Which is, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I w I even um, I went to a lot of the club games and seen how they had integrated so well into their into their into their clubs, they, and uh, they did themselves proud. You know, uh, they were all in different clubs, but they came together to train uh, in the gym and with a few rugby sessions with different players. Uh, different invite coaches and things like that. So it was a real eye opener for the players, and they, they pushed on from then. I think I think at the time it was about eighty or ninety percent of them came through into professional rugby, which is fantastic. No, and we did the same with, uh, with the Glasgow Thistles. It was a kind of similar thing, you know. So uh, just to pick the best under nineteen players and bring them across there, and that was still going for a, you know Colin Ireland took that kept on going with that for for a number of years, which is which was great, you know. Uh, amazing, and Ian Monaghan's now in Hong Kong coaching the Hong Kong women's seven squad. We, you, your influence reaches far and wide, Snorky. The Snoops is still going; they're going well. He's a good coach, Snoops. Uh, we keep in touch. Uh, you know he's going well. You know, so it's uh, it's like uh, the evolving of everything. You know, just you, players will move into different areas. Uh, you know, obviously, he had, a, he had a great understanding of the game, and he's, he's taking it further. You know, to, to his coaching. When you first started coaching, I'm a, I'm a teacher, a coach, and a, and a parent, and I think you, when you first get those roles, you tend to do what was done unto you, and then you find your way by trial and error and experience and all those other things. You you had quite a lot of coaches from club to district to national team. How did you first start coaching, and do you look back now and think, what the hell was I doing, or do you, are you... Are you a bit kinder to yourself? No, I think uh, everyone evolves. You, you have some. I mean, even last week I, I did one part of the session with Munster, and uh, I wasn't really happy with. It, but just you always kind of learn. You, you, the big thing is to to keep a level head on these things because some things 
you know, you, you're different things to different people, and, and uh, you, you'll well know, Bruce, that you, it's whatever you say sometimes can get, get misinterpreted. You have to be really concise what you say. So um, there's a lot of planning involved now. Uh, we, you know, we just try and hit, you know, we have a real theme to whatever we're doing. Uh, back in the day, I think it was just about, um, it's trying to get a balance. I mean, we didn't know we were doing that thing, but I think the, the big thing for me was having, showing how passionate you are and uh, and that, that that's how, what you need to do first is show how passionate you are about the game and how much you want to improve the players and improve the individual. So I think that was, I would always think, I, I would hope that I'd, I'd come across that way. So, um, but you had to work at that. And uh, a lot of coaches have, have um, resonated with me on different things, uh, different aspects of the game. See, so, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go down the route of uh, me being looking at the scrum, for example. I know what I want from the scrum, but uh, I would never go in depth, <laughs> especially in the in the front row. <laughs> and there, there were coaches like Jim Telfer and Derek Grant. You you can't coach like them. You know, you're talking about relationship and the things you say. You couldn't have coached like Derek Grant and Jim Telfer. It doesn't mean they were wrong. It's just that was theirs. You had to find your own voice. Are you a, are you a shouter? Are you are you a, do you tug on the emotion? Do you use different tools at different times? Yeah, I think you do. do. I, I'd I'd be more of the um, emotion side in terms of uh, when and bark when you me have to bark and and barking is just you have to be really um, sure it's at the right time. I think there's there's a bit of everything. You need to be a bit of everything, but I, I'd probably lean towards. Um, showing the, how passionate I was with the, the players and the game and the game ahead and and trying to make them uh, prepared and so if they get the preparation right they're, they're they they just bring the skills on the on the day so uh, that's that's where I would like to be you know if thought of or if somebody was talking about me I'd, I'd be prepared preparing the players and uh, and be really emotional but you know in terms of how we get the how you get the right emotion for the for the game, and because um, it's part and parcel nowadays, you, you know, you need to be know what's coming and, not, and be prepared for what's coming. But in the same way, be prepared that it, shit could hit the fan or or things go wrong or whatever. You know, you just need to be you need to evolve as the game goes. You know, so you you mentioned the word learning a lot. Um, you said that last week you had a bit of your session that you weren't happy with. So you, you're obviously doing a lot of self-analysis and the game you're in is involved with results, whether that's players as becoming professionals or it's the numbers at the end of the game on the scoreboard. Who helps you with your coaching? Who's over your shoulder saying, try this, change that? Uh, have you thought of this? I'm oh, lucky here. or I'm really privileged to be in an environment which encourages that and um we're trying to be as open as we can and and uh some things you might might not like to hear some things which is maybe in a few years uh, a number of years ago i would not have taken that poorly but uh i think you need to be open open-minded and uh, let just you know, be open to learning i'm lucky here we've got people like uh, stephen larkham who's an excellent coach and uh um and ian Coslow who's just came back from wasps uh, some you know up and coming coaches like Andy Kariaki and boys like that. So we're just very open with each other. Even the, I mean the analysis uh, we've had. You know in terms of um, we've got Elliot Corkin back from Pau, who has been a couple of years now. Uh, so we kind of work together and we're we're kind of helping each other get better. We're really lucky. Obviously, we get everything filmed and uh, we're some you can you can hear actually you can hear our audio in it as well. So. It's um, it it can be it's it can be a wee bit intimidating the first time, but once you get used to it, I think you, you get better, and you, you can be more judgmental in your performance. Because I mean, I would hate to watch myself sometimes. <laughs> uh, it's like you know, you see it, you see yourself sometimes. What the hell am I doing here? But um, every day, you, Greg, every day. When you get used to it. I think you you learn learn to cope with it a bit better, and how you can you can grow from it. You know. It's a funny thing, isn't it? And some of it maybe is ego. You spend your time as a player getting feedback all the time, you know, during a session, after a session, mm. video analysis, and then you become a coach. And 
it it suddenly becomes quite a different thing. You don't get as much feedback. You're probably looked on as being, you know, you're finished. You're you're the finished article. Mm. Who's who's going to give you feedback? What is that? You said it was difficult the first time. You've obviously done your masters in it. Are you now relishing that? Do you go looking for it? Um, yeah, some some sometimes. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually be very self aware. I'd be really self aware in terms of how I come across and self conscious and that kind of thing, which is part and parcel of me. It's maybe not with some of the other people, but I would I would know with some players. I, I'd recognise some of the players in the session, and I'd get. A, I'd know by the feedback. You know, I'd, I would need the, the spoken word. I'd, I'd know by looking at them how, how, how it went across, and and uh, I think you get a real feel for it. That's the big thing when you have experience. You get a feel for it, and uh, how you can change and evolve things, and maybe alter things as they go. So I would, yeah, we have a lot of session plans, but I might not stick to the session plan. I'd, I'd just go with the, with the flow in terms of where I thought the session was, and and seeing the reaction of some of the players, you know. So. Um, yeah, we tend to, you know, some things are a bit rigid, but we, we I'm, I'm really, get, I try and encourage myself to a bit more uh, to go with the flow, you know. And do you encourage that when you're having dialogue with players? Because normally it's it's about the players' performance. Do you do you flip it? Have you asked players how did you feel that came across? Did you think I hit the point there? Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, they are the. They're the recipients of your, all your endeavours, so I'd say you have to use them and um, take, a, take a word for it as well. Because I, um, I would encourage it with some of the players to to to, to grow this, not just grow them, but grow the session and grow the squad. You know, that's a that's a vulnerable position to put yourself in, though. Yeah, yeah, I I totally agree. I've uh, I think, um, but the being vulnerable is good. I think I think you need to cope with it. It's um, one of my friends actually is doing a PhD in vulnerability in, in elite sport, and uh, I've been talking to them a lot about this recently. Now, vulnerability is in different and so many places. And I think he he can be, but you have to be prepared to to work in that kind of environment. Yeah, I, I love that. It's an interesting one uh, because if you get better the outcome should be the player gets better and the program gets better and the results get better. But there'd be a, there'd be a lot of coaches who might hear you say that and go, absolutely no chance. <laughs> no, I'm in, like I'm saying, I'm in a, a good level of coaching here, a good environment, really open environment. Uh, it, you would pick and choose who you want to, you know, you wouldn't say that the young player at the moment, you're just trying to find his feet. Um, so it's your it's a bit it's again goes back to relationships bruce in terms of a lot of the players in our senior senior group which which the uh, which i was on about the session in particular had come through the academy i know the boys i know the player you know really well um it's not just knowing them as a person but you know them about their, their family their circumstances and so on so it's really getting to know the players as much as you can and uh that's a big thing i, I go after in terms of when new players come in, getting to know them a bit better, you know. I'd love to be a fly in the wall when Jose Mourinho is showing a little bit of vulnerability to a player asking about his coaching. Do you reckon he would be up for that? <laughs> uh, I'm sure maybe not Jose, but uh, Pep would be. Pep, okay, Pep would be. So what does is, what is the future hold? I mean, you're sitting in a place now that you couldn't have imagined you were going to be in. Uh, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a job. It probably wasn't an opportunity that you thought a Scotsman would would get. What what does the future hold for you? Um, I can just I, I don't know really. I, I'm just I, where I am at the moment. I, I mean, I I really enjoy what I do. The family is really settled here. Uh, Fiona's a PE teacher. She actually works in uh, in Limerick Prison, so. Uh, you know that that feels like she <laughs> <laughs> uh, No, she she really enjoys that role. I couldn't. I don't know how she enjoys it, but she she loves that role. She's worked in secondary and primary uh, in England, Wales, England, in, in Scotland and Ireland. So she really enjoys that role. So really settled myself and Fiona here. Uh, Kira's in fifth year, so she's got big exams next year. So try get them through that. Jack has started a business degree in UL. And he's obviously got rugby. He's going after his rugby as well. So we're in a pretty settled position here in terms of where we are. Um, 
I just really enjoy the role here. I'm I'm really disappointed that Stephen Larkham's moving on because uh, I got on really well with him and um, I've learned a lot from from Stephen. I, I have other coaches. You learn a lot of different coaches, but uh, no, I, I just think I enjoy the role here and uh, I just can't wait for the next batch of players come through and uh, and take it from there. You know. And those those relationships that you you've spoken a lot about mm-hmm. when you get hold of a young player. And they come into the environment. Can you can you tell pretty quickly, or have there been some surprises where maybe you've had to put a lot of time and energy into someone, and they've got there in the end? Oh, there's different different aspects. There's players who just you know encourage, maybe even even pull back. We've got a player there who I had to really pull back because he was getting too intense about things, taking them too far, uh, and he's. He's 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 moved on to the seniors and doing great stuff. Where you've got other players where you need to kick out, kick them up the backside. As you, as you know, you just they're different different players and um, and the players that have stood in front now and again don't come into the building. I don't want you to come in the building that kind of thing at this moment in time. So there's a there's a there's a big spectrum of different personalities you need to to be aware of and. Um, and just try and encourage and try and get the other, to the other side, you know. So I, 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 that's a that's the inspiring thing for me is not everybody's the same, and you just you, you're not trying to make them all the same. You try keep you you there's different personalities. Keep the personality, but but show that what the good side of them when they come onto the rugby field. I love it. I can I can tell how much you enjoy it, and your enthusiasm comes through, and you're obviously analysing it. Smart cookie, Greg. Smart cookie. Tell me who's who is your best pal? Who is it you loved playing with? Who did you like to sit next to in the changing room? Oh, my hog days. Uh, oh, there's so many really. Um, when I first went into, it, I was mesmerised like by Jim Rennick and Brian Hegarty even playing alongside these kind of players. It was fantastic. Um, you know, I, I I thrive I thrived off different different personalities. I, I used to love playing with Colin Gas. I used to love playing with him. And actually, I I got some uh, real vintage footage there sent across to me by Alan McCready there the other week. I, I bumped into Alan, who was Bill McLaren's yeah some uh, boy statistician back in the day and uh, he had he, he downloaded uh, games, so he sent me a whole load. We had spent a couple of weekends ago watching all the old um, games it's fantastic so my son was having a Jack was having a real giggle at some of the footage but uh, but it'd it'd be like a different game see if you watched a game of football for the late 80s early 90s it wouldn't look that much different for the football now Mm. but rugby it's like a completely different universe I know I I, um, I was talking to John Jeffrey about it actually because the, the one of the games I got was Hoy Kelso. It was a big um, decider. This, the, the, the term is a decider. But the eighth game in, it was a decider <laughs> between Hoy and Kelso. And Hoy Kelso were going really well at the time. Uh, with likes of um, obviously Bob and uh, Andrew Kerr and um, Gary Callender uh, and uh, JJ, Eric Paxton. They were, they were loaded, the Kelso team. So we won down in the uh, in Pointer that day, basically by, by me box kicking the life out. So uh, it's a bit. Um... Uh, you were box kicking, but you didn't have a line of twelve forwards <laughs> to protect you and give you all the time in the world. No, I just just had the. Uh, I think it was Jim Hayes' big 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 backside in front of me, so that was big enough. Was <laughs> when when you're working with the nines at Munster, do you ever give it the? In my day, you didn't get your hands on the ball in the ruck. Yeah, I've had this conversation with a few players, uh, Conor Murray, especially just, you know, back in my day, there was no bl- nothing like blockers or anything, or um, a sprinter here, a sprinter roll here or there. But no, I just, um, I think the, the principles are the same, though. I mean, we've had a few nines here, that just um, even showing different ways how how to kick, kick and for example. It's a, it's a big skill. Uh, we've recognised that it's a big skill. It's something that's lacking now because the the development part of the game now is all about running the ball and things like that. So the kind of closed skills like kicking um, have kind of taken a, a lesser degree of um, importance, you know. So we're, we're trying to initiate a bit more kicking 
down the down in the position specific stuff. So because um, um, the players who don't play a, a number of sports are kind of are not um, yeah. not as good at that. So we we look we are, that's why we encourage players to play Gaelic football and things like that. So they can you can get a real hold of some of the skills like that. You know, the hand foot yeah. and foot eye. They they were in the up Wilton Park kicking a round ball, an egg shaped ball, uh, any shaped ball. No, the Wilton Lodge is uh, is um, brought a lot of players on. It's uh, it's uh, it's the same in uh, in different places like Gala. You know, it's it's. I think it's you, you look back on that area, and even though I was there a couple couple of months ago, I was I was when I was up the park. I watched uh, I was up there in the morning watching a primary school game. I was up there in the afternoon watching a soccer game my, my nephew was playing in. So it's, you know, he, like I said at the start, you just don't, and a lot of people don't um, appreciate what they have on their doorstep. No, I remember teaching P at Hoik and this wee lad coming up, the weekend, my uncle Greg. <laughs> Him. That's yes, <laughs> yes, I do. And I called him Snorky for then on. <laughs> yeah, we love that. <laughs> so, come on then. I've kept you for a long time. I love chatting to you. It's been so good. Uh, we've not even got onto your Southern Reporter days. <laughs> <laughs> so, for you, Greg Oliver, happiness is? I just, my happiness is watching rugby. I watch it. I'm, I watch it all the time. I, um, I'm i actually going to a game today between Askel Reach and uh, uh, Crescent Comp. So, uh, I just love to watch the game. I, Obviously, I've got a wee bit more a uh, thing with uh, Jack coming through. See, so I've, I'm trying to separate my role with uh, being a parent and uh, a coach. So uh, happiness is, for me is watching a game uh, nowadays, and uh, I, I my time is gone. But I'm, I'm trying to encourage the other ones, the other players, to, to to get as much out of the game as I got. I bet you're bloody good at it. Can you watch as a supporter? Uh, yeah, I can. I um, it's hard sometimes. Uh, you get caught up in the, um, oh no, obviously I get caught up in the coaching side of it and watch for you know different things. But um, I still can raise my voice sometimes. Uh, yeah, monster game. <laughs> <laughs> And you still love the game. Greg, brilliant. I've absolutely loved it. And Roddy Deans is promising me that the two of us are going to come and visit you uh, on, on a wee fact-finding mission. So watch this space. I'll be on the phone. Okay, well, you're always welcome here. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Absolutely brilliant to see you. Hopefully catch up with you very, very soon. Thanks, Bruce. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, my man. Absolutely class. Loved it. <laughs> Well, there you go. What a superstar. Absolutely love it. And the future is very bright. I reckon we're going to see and hear a lot more for Greg Oliver. If you've enjoyed it, you can catch us on Apple, Acast and Spotify. You can also watch on Facebook and YouTube. Go back and have a look at the back catalogue and catch up on some of those other episodes. Great to have a hoik man on. His happiness is watching rugby. I don't think any of us can dispute that. My name is Bruce Aitchison from the Happiness Is podcast and my happiness is egg-shaped. Stay safe and I look forward to speaking to you all again very, very soon.